Gato. First of all, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu on Sunday evening. We have a very interesting, a very exciting program for us, inshallah, about the Isra and Mi'raj, the miraculous night journey of the Prophet. Uh, try to limit uh, bringing food and drink into the musalla. You can eat outside if you wish, but after you're done, then you can come back inside, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, try moving up as much as possible because we will have, we are expecting a lot of people, inshallah. And for the program itself, we are going to start with Sheikh Mikail and the backdrop to the Isra and Mi'raj, the miraculous night journey, by talking about the 10th year after the Prophet وسلم, became the Prophet. And talking about what led, what the events that led to the Isra al Mi'raj. So pay attention closely, inshallah. A very exciting program for us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbak wa hubba amalin yuqarribuna ila hubbik ya arhamur rahimin. Thank everyone for joining us um, as we talk about this moment, this, this portion of the Prophet Sallallahu life. Uh, that was a, quite literally a roller coaster. There were amazing lows and there were amazing highs. Um, and I'm going to begin by speaking about the backdrop to the Isra and Mi'raj, the night journey of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It, prior to the Isra and Mi'raj, in the, as uh, Hafiz Shahir was just mentioning, in the 10th year of prophethood, um, the, the, the Quraysh had put the Muslims through this uh, strenuous boycott. I mean, they cut them off completely. All resources, everything were blocked off from the Banu Hashim, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what we have to understand was that this was very difficult. This was very difficult, and it was unprecedented as well. It was extremely hard on the, on the Bani Hashim. The Prophet Sallallahu his entire family, basically economically, socially, every aspect, they're cut off from the rest of society. And the ultimatum is simple. The ultimatum is you either turn the Prophet Sallallahu over or you're die, you'll die hungry like this. You'll die in this state with nothing. And the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Muslim and non-Muslim, they stood by him. They didn't give up on him. Because that was the culture. That was the, the way of the streets of, of, of Mecca. That's how it was. You didn't hand somebody over. That was your family member. Uh, Ibn Ishaq, he says that finally, there was a miraculous moment in which the Prophet Sallallahu he comes to Abu Talib and he says, Allah has informed me that the scroll or the constitution which has this agreement has been consumed by termites. It's gone. And Abu Talib goes, are you sure? He goes, I'm sure. And Abu Talib at this moment, subhanAllah, Abu Talib goes, my son has never lied to me. I've never known my son to lie. And that's the relationship that they had. Ever since a young boy, he brought the Prophet Sallallahu in. He says, my son has never lied to me. So he goes to the Quraysh and I don't want to spend too much time. It's an amazing story. But at the end of the story, the boycott is lifted. The Banu Hashim, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, are now able to interact with the rest of Mecca. They're able to marry amongst them, eat amongst them, buy and sell amongst them, and everything is good. But everything isn't that good. The years of the boycott have been hard on us, y'all. The children were starving, families were going through difficulty. The only way food got into our neighborhood, we ain't have no Whole Foods down there. The only way food got in there was if people snuck that food into Benu Hashim. And by the time it was over, it played its toll emotionally, psychologically, and physically on our lives. In a short time after the boycott was over, a group of the Quraysh, they come to speak to Abu Talib. And I'm going to read this incident to you. Ibn Ishaq, he says, as Abu Talib began to get really sick, and the Quraysh heard that Abu Talib was very sick, they sent a group of people, 25. Amongst them was Utba, Shayba, Abu Jahal, Umayyah bin Khalaf, Abu Sufyan, all the big honchos, the big, the big heads of leading the kuffar at that time. 
They all go. And they go to meet Abu Talib because he's, he's getting weaker now. And once and for all, we need this man to step up and stop his nephew Muhammad, who's like his son almost, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the narration says that they entered فَأَذِنَ لَهُمْ He said, come on in. He was cordial. He welcomed them. فَلَمَّا دَخَلُوا عَلَيْهِ قَالُوا When they came in, they said, يَا أَبَا طَالِبْ أَنْتَ كَبِيرُنَا وَسَيِّدُنَا You are our leader. You are the, the elder amongst us. Do justice to us regarding Ibn Akhika, your nephew. Handle him. مُرْهُ فَلْيَكُفُّ عَنْ شَتْمِ آلِهَتِنَا Tell him he has to stop this cursing our idols. This has to end. What happens? Abu Talib, he says, okay, why don't you call him here? I can't do anything. فَبَعَثَ إِلَيْهِ Abu Talib. Abu Talib had the Prophet Sallallahu brought. This is just coming out of the boycott. Things have been so difficult. Abu Talib is reaching old age now. فَجَاءَ النَّبِي Sallallahu And I want you to picture it. Listen. When you study the seerah, do not study the seerah knowing the end in mind. Don't study the seerah knowing, yo, chill out, Fatima is coming in 20 minutes. No. Put yourself in the moment that you're studying, not knowing what's going to happen in the next year. So you can feel the full emotion of that situation. So here the Prophet Sallallahu walks into the home. And as he walks into the home, he sees 25 city councilmen. Put it any other way, 25 city councilmen gathered around his elderly uncle because of him, because of him, because of him. He comes in, وَبَيْنَ هُمْ وَبَيْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ Whole group of people in front of Abu Talib. So Abu Jahl sees him walk in. Abu Jahl's a, a savvy guy. And جَلَسَ إِلَى جَنْبِ أَبِي طَالِبْ so, so he didn't want the Prophet to sit next to Abu Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because then proximity, you know, you can nudge somebody. Come on, Ankh. So he, he sat between. Abu Jahl jumps up and sits right next to Abu Talib, the closest spot. So what? So that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isn't closer. What happens? Now they start to speak. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have anywhere close to sit. Abu Talib speaks, Ya bin Akhi, hey nephew. These are the city councilmen gathered here. And they're saying that uh, you gotta stop, you know? You're, you're cursing the idols, you're, 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 you're uh, calling out their bad ways of life, you gotta stop. This is what they're saying. Faqal Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, moment, huge moment in the Prophet's life. Ara'aytum, he says, if, if, if I chill out, will you do something for me? Will you just give me one word? Just give me one word. Abu Jahl looks up and says, one word? I'll give you ten words, just stop. I'll give you ten. The Prophet Sallallahu says that one word is la ilaha illallah. He says, nah, never, man. Never. And this is that well-known moment where he says, to his uncle, I can't stop. I see the struggle you're going through. I see the struggle. I want you to imagine the psychological like, trauma of watching your own clan go through a boycott because this message that you have. Could you watch your own children suffer because of a decision you made? That would, that would hurt so much. So here the prophet is in front of his elderly uncle he's, who's like a father to him. And in that moment... He says these, these words that go down in the, the books of history. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, Oh uncle, if you were to bring the sun and place it in my hand and the moon and place it in my other hand and ask me to stop, meaning if you gave me the world, I can't do it. Allah's telling, I have to do this. Abu Talib looks up. He was just doing formalities, just so you know. He goes, you haven't asked for too much. You haven't asked for too much. And he looks at the notables. He looks at the city council and he says, all he wants is one word from you. And they got up upset. Nope, 
We're never given those words. Gathering is over, city council, meeting adjourned. The Prophet Sallallahu uncle stood by his side yet again. Always had his back. What happens next? A few days pass. A few days. At this point, Abu Talib is about 80 years old. And it seems that he's getting very close to death. The Prophet Sallallahu comes to his house. When he walks into the house, he's laying down. And you could tell, it seems he's about to make that transition, guys. Have you ever sat next to a person making that transition? The room feels different. The angels and the things around that room, the, the aura in the room is different. The Prophet ﷺ walks in the room and lo and behold, who's sitting right there? Abu Jahl and Abdullah bin Umayyah sitting right there. The Prophet ﷺ walks in. فقال, he says, please leave. Let me talk to my uncle by myself. Let me talk to my uncle. I don't have time for your games, Abu Jahl. I don't have time. Let me talk to my uncle by himself. Abu Jahl goes, I ain't leaving. It's my uncle too. He's my relative too. You don't have more right on him than I do. When he does, but he wants to play that card. He says, even if you're close to him, I'm close to him too. I'm not leaving. So I don't have time. The prophet doesn't have time to get into these small things with Abu Jahl. So he turns his attention to his uncle, who he's been working on for 10 years or more. Just say, la ilaha illallah. And if you have Muslim family members, I don't care how pious or how chill or how whatever they are. If they say, la ilaha illallah, you are blessed. You are blessed. The Prophet Sallallahu he then looks at his uncle and he says, Ya Ammi, O oh uncle, Juzita khair. May Allah reward you with good. Kalaftani saghira. You carried me when I was little. Wahavantani kabira. And you brought me in when I was bigger. You supported me. Fajuzita anni khaira. Ya Amma. He goes, O oh uncle, may Allah reward you greatly. And then he says these words, A'inni ala nafsik bi kalimatin wahid. Please, please, can you just say one phrase for me? Can you just say one statement for me so that I can intercede for you on the day of judgment? Help me with one thing. Say la ilaha illallah. Abu Talib with Abu Jahl sitting in the room, Abdullah bin Umayyah sitting in the room, the Prophet sitting close to him, see the room. See the moment. Feel what's happening. In that moment, Abu Talib replies, Ibn Akhi, hey nephew, Wallahi lawla makhafat as If it wasn't for the fact that I'm worried that people are going to talk about us later, what are they going to say? Kya kehenge lo. What are they going to say? What are they going to say? What are people going to say? If it wasn't for the fact I'm worried, Listen, brothers and sisters, the thing that influences us the most is social influence. On his deathbed, he's leaving the world. He will literally not see these people in a matter of moments, but he can't stop thinking about what people are going to say. The way you live is the way you die. If you live your life only thinking about what people are going to say, if you live your life letting their thoughts about you determine your actions, maybe you'll die in that same state. So he says, I can't. I know what you're saying is true, but I can't say it. And right when it seemed as if maybe he would say it, Abu, Abu Jahl leans over and he goes, are you going to leave the old way of our forefathers? And Abu Talib lays back and he continues to say, on the way of our forefathers, on the way of our forefathers, until his soul is taken out. The Prophet وسلم, is, is, is hurt. The verses are revealed. Muhammad, you can't guide Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who you love. It's not in your control. You can't. No matter how much you love someone, guidance is from Allah. The Prophet is broken. The Prophet وسلم, is 
struggling with dealing with this father-like figure that has now left his life, brought him in, protected him, despite not believing in him, protected him and said, do what you got to do. I got your back. And all of a sudden, he's gone now. And a few days later, some say three days later, some say about 15 to 10, the prophet said to him, is hit again. Hit again. Sometimes in life, y'all, it seems like the hardships are just like lined up. It seems like they're just lined up. And that's why we study the seerah. Because no matter who you are, no matter what you've gone through, you will find inspiration in the life of Muhammad Wasallam. You are elevated by reading about his elevation. Wallah. In this moment, the Prophet Wasallam has lost his father-like figure. The only one that got his back. In a few days later, because of the hardship of the boycott, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Who was Khadija? Who was Khadija? What can we say about Khadija? All you need to know is one thing. When the revelation began, and this angel came to him the first time, and he was quivering and shaking out of fear, he ran to her. He ran to her in fear, and she held him. She embraced him. She calmed him down. The way a mother calms a scared child in the middle of the night. The Prophet Sallallahu ran to her. Because here's the deal. A lot of us, we want to be strong men and think we can handle everything by ourselves. Well, the strongest man I know, he ran to his wife in a time of difficulty. He ran to her. He said, cover me, hold me. And she wrapped him and she held him. And he said, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy. Something's wrong with me. And with force and confidence, she spoke to his heart and she said, no. No. You know, man, I used to play little league football. A few times I would feel I was small. You know, my son, he struggles with this too. He's like, dad, we so small. I'm like, yo, don't worry, man. You, you, got your, you got agility, though. You know what I mean? We're quick. And, and how many times my mother would just grab me when I, when I lost hope that how am I going to play against all these big guys? She would grab me and say, no, you got this. In that moment, in that moment, the Prophet Sallallahu felt that his world was going crazy. He runs to his wife. He runs to Khadija radiallahu an, the one he says, she believed in me when everyone denied. And in fact, I would go further. She believed in him before he believed in himself. That's who she was. Before he knew who he was, she knew who he was. Some say that's why she married him too. She said, I already know who you're going to be. So he ran to her. She supported him and she said, no, Allah will never, ever disgrace you. Because you know why? And she listed all of these beautiful qualities that she had seen in this great man. She listed all of these beautiful qualities. And here five, six, seven days after his father-like figure leaves the world without faith. It's one thing to lose one. It's something else to lose someone and know in your heart that they don't believe in Allah. You have no idea. You don't know what it feels like not to be able to pray for someone that you love who just died. Can you imagine knowing your, 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 your grandmother, your nani, your daddy, your whoever passed away and you can't make dua for them? You go to the imam, you say, imam, you know, can I make dua? And the imam keeps it real. He's like, no, if they died as a disbeliever, you can't. When Abu Talib dies, the Prophet Wasallam, he says, wallahi, I'm going to make dua for him. Until the verse comes down. And the verse comes down, ma kana lin nabi walladina amanu an yastaghfiru lil mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the verse down. You are not allowed to do this. He's torn up. What can I do? Allah says, Inna This man is broken. The Prophet lost Abu Talib. A few days later, he lost his beloved wife, his support for everything. Listen to this, guys. In life, you have external enemies and internal enemies. 
You got haters outside that will hate you and knock you down and stop you from becoming the best you you can be. And you got internal shayateen and internal thoughts that are trying to tell you you're not who you are. You're not what you can reach to be. The external support was Abu Talib. The internal support was Khadija. They're both gone now. They're both gone now. Where is he going to run to now? Human beings are unique. We don't run to shelter in fear. We, we, we run to people. That's our nature. Last night, the other night, the storm was going crazy. Little dude ran down the stairs, jumped in our bed. I'm halfway off the bed now. He didn't run in his closet. He ran to people. When the Prophet Sallallahu was scared, he ran to a person, his beloved wife. In the times of difficulty, he ran to Abu Talib. We need people. And at this moment in his life, 10th year of this message, the Prophet ﷺ has just lost his external protection and his internal place of solitude and, 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 and reassurance. What happened as a result? Was he, oh, I'm good. I don't need to worry about it. I could get through this. No, quite the contrary. The woman he had been married to for over 25 years has just passed away. The narration by Ibn Sa'd says, وَقَدَ وَجَدَ رَسُولَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ لِفَقْدِ عَائِشَ The Prophet ﷺ was deeply troubled and pained by the loss of Aisha, uh, Khadija. Deeply troubled, deeply troubled. وَلَزِمَ بَيْتَ He stayed home. He didn't even go out. He was torn up. He didn't even go out. It was narrated, they say that that he was so that he was so hurt that the Sahaba started to get worried about him. And what we learned from this is what he taught us. Pain is okay. Pain and sadness doesn't go against sadness ain't a sin, yo. Sadness ain't a sin. The Prophet ﷺ was hurt. It was difficult. And now, at, at this time, when he loses all of this support, when he loses all of this, where are we going to go? What's going to happen next? Do you know what the next thing happens in the seerah is? He goes to Ta'if, y'all. Do you know what Ta'if represents? Ta'if represents the hardest day in his life. Why is it the hardest day? Because he fled Mecca because he does not have any more support. He does not have any more support. So he goes, maybe the neighboring city will be, be, be nicer to me than these people here. He flees the Ta'if. And what does Ta'if become? Ta'if becomes a moment where him and his son, Zaid bin Muhammad. Yeah, that's what I call him. Zaid bin Muhammad. Because that's what they knew him by at that time. Him and Zayd bin Muhammad go to Ta'if. And how are they kicked out of the city? Their stones are being thrown at them as they arrange two rows to escort them out of the city, throwing stones at the ankles of the Prophet Sallallahu And he would fall down, grabbing his ankles, and then they would pick him back up. This was the darkest time in his life. This is our Prophet Sallallahu When I read these moments... I hug my loved ones. When I read these moments, I remember that the Prophet Sallallahu has been through the most, any difficulty I've been through. If you've lost a child, which I can't even fathom, the Prophet has gone through it. If you've lost a loved one without them believing in Allah, which I know the pain of, the Prophet has been through that too. And if you lost a spouse, can't even imagine. Your Prophet has been through that too. This was called by later on scholars, they called this the year of sorrow. Amul Huzan. And, and, and hopefully by studying this and talking about this, we're able to realize that he's an example for us. Hardships are not a sign of Allah's hatred. Quite the contrary. In fact, right before, right before the openings, the difficulties may show up. So we just covered the year of sorrow of the Prophet Sallallahu where he lost his uncle, 
without faith, and he lost his beloved wife. Many years later, when uh, the husband of his daughter, Zainab, her husband, Abu al-As, was captive after Badr. Zainab, the prophet's daughter, was married to a non-Muslim. And she was back in Mecca because that's where her husband was. But he was a good man to the Prophet Sallallahu but societal, socially, he was on the other side of the ranks. Well, he got captured. He got captured. And it was time to send money to ransom. So Zainab goes in her closet and she looks for something valuable and she grabs a necklace and she sends it to Medina. She sends this necklace to Medina to get her husband and ransom her husband. And the messenger comes with this message, this, this ransom. Here's the ransom. The Prophet Sallallahu opens it up. And what does he see? He sees a necklace of Khadija. That Khadija had given her daughter, Zainab. And the Prophet Sallallahu sees this. And just imagine this moment. Think of it yourself. You're there and you open and you see something that reminds you of some loved one. Your mother, your grandmother, your, your brother, your sister, someone you love. He opens and he sees it and his heart breaks. He's torn to pieces. This was my Khadijah's. This was my Khadijah's. Aisha says, I never got jealous over anybody the way I got jealous over her. Nobody. And one time she would say, why are you always talking about that old lady? Somebody, Allah gave you better. The Prophet said, Allah did not give me better. She was there for me when nobody was there for me. She supported me when nobody supported me. When I was poor, when I was broke, Allah says, we enriched you. The Mufassirin says, we married you to Khadija. This is the year of sorrow. This is the year of sorrow. The Prophet Sallallahu did not respond with stoicism that uh, I can't be hurt because I'm so connected to Allah. He was broken. It hurt. It hurt. And that allows us, it allows us to realize that sadness isn't a sin, but expect openings from Allah right after the sadness. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. Brothers and sisters, we have a beautiful night for you tonight. Just enjoy the listening and enjoy being in the mention of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. These gatherings are blessed, y'all. These gatherings clean your heart, bring your hearts present to these moments, and enjoy the company of people just saying صلى الله عليه وسلم. جزاكم الله خير. JazakAllah khairan Sheikh Mika'il for the beautiful reminder about the internal reality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the emotions he was going through through the uh, death of Abu Talib and the death of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. We will now have none other than Sheikh Abdul Nasser cover the next portion, uh, the night journey itself, the Isra, the, the night journey. Uh, and we're going to cover that miraculous journey right now, inshallah, after which we will stop for Maghrib. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares within the Qur'an that all perfection, absolute perfection, belongs only and solely to Allah. The one who took his chosen beloved servant, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by night from al-Masjid al-Haram, the sacred house of God, which is in Mecca, to the furthest mosque, 
which is the title that was bestowed upon the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِنُرِيَهُ min ayatina." That this journey of the Prophet ﷺ, he was taken on this journey specifically so that we, Allah is speaking in the first person, so that we could show him our miraculous signs. Now, even when you look at the title of this event, there are two words, Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Those are two separate words and they refer to the two distinct portions of this experience that the Prophet ﷺ had. Al-Isra literally means to travel a large distance at night time. And that refers to the first part of the journey of the Prophet ﷺ, which was from Mecca to Jerusalem. The second word, Al-Mi'raj, comes from Uruj, which means to ascend. Mi'raj means the ascension. And that refers to the part of his experience Remarkable experience on that blessed night when the Prophet ﷺ was then elevated, he ascended from Al Masjid Al Aqsa, from Jerusalem, to the heavens and beyond, which we'll be talking about. So, we're going to be breaking for Salat al Maghrib in about 15 minutes, inshallah, because that's one of the big morals and lessons of this entire period, this event from the life of the Prophet and we'll be talking about that later tonight. So we'll be breaking for Salat al-Maghrib insha'Allah. What I'd like to do is, before Salat al-Maghrib, talk about the first part of that journey as much as possible. So the Prophet wasallam. first of all, when did this Al-Isra wal Mi'raj occur? Shaykh Mikail provided some context in terms of where it's placed in the life of the Prophet wasallam, and that is that it is placed after the passing of Khadija Al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother Khadija, and the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu Abu Talib, and after the Prophet sallallahu returned back from the experience at At-Ta'if. So, the scholars say that the event of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj happened somewhere between 12 to 16 months before the Hijrah, before the migration to Medina. So it happened about a year, year and a half prior to that. The exact month and the date on which it occurred is not completely agreed on. The popular narrative that Ibn Kathir ta'ala also validates is that it happened on the 27th of the month of Rajab, which is why we're having this event around this time. But at the same time, there's a little bit of discussion there in terms of exactly when it transpired and when it occurred. But that's not really the purpose of our discussion here. We're here to actually learn about it and then reflect on it and see what we can internalize from this remarkable moment. So, it was a very cool, tranquil night. This is shortly after the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha. Now, if you recall, the Prophet ﷺ had four daughters at the time of the passing of his wife. Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, his eldest daughter, was married. The two other daughters were not married yet, but they were a little bit older. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was still very young. And so what would happen is that the Prophet sallallahu where his residence was, his neighbor was his cousin, who was kind of like a big sister to him. Her name was Umhani. And she lived right next door. And she had set aside a room in her house where when the Prophet ﷺ was busy or preoccupied with things, that Fatima could go and stay there. And that way she was with someone. The Prophet ﷺ on this night, he went home and laid down for a little bit. And the Prophet ﷺ says that the ceiling of my home opened up and I was commanded to go to the Haram, to the Kaaba, to the Masjid. He said, before I left and departed from there, I went and checked on Fatima in the home of Umhani. And then I made my way to the Masjid. Now when he arrived at the Masjid, the Masjid al-Haram, if you've ever seen the pictures of the Kaaba or if you've been there, 
you know that there is the structure of the Kaaba, and then there is that little half circle on the side of the Kaaba that is open, that is technically a part of the Kaaba. It's called Hatim, also it's known as Hijr Ismail. The Prophet ﷺ was then commanded to lay down there in that area. And he laid down in that area, <clears throat> and then two angels approached him. The Prophet ﷺ in one narration mentions that those two angels were none other than Jibreel and Mikail السلام, Gabriel and Michael, the archangels. And they came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ pointed at his, at his body and he said from here, from the top of his chest down to his belly button, the Prophet ﷺ said that they, Jibreel ﷺ placed his finger here and he traced it and it opened my body. They had a tray, a, a golden tray, tistan min dhahabin, mamlu atan, imanan. They had this tray made out of gold and it had some water that is mentioned that was the water of Zamzam, but it represented faith. And the Prophet ﷺ said that then they poured that faith into my chest, into my heart. And then Jibreel ﷺ traced his finger back up and it closed up his chest miraculously. And the understanding of that is that the Prophet ﷺ was about to experience something that no human being, no creation had ever experienced before. Nearness to Allah that no one has ever experienced. And so his heart was strengthened. He was prepared and prepped to be able to really experience that moment. And to be able to handle that experience. And what's very interesting, I'll draw the parallel here, is that the Prophet ﷺ says, As-salatu mi'arajul mu'min, the prayer is the ascension of the believer. When we pray to Allah, that is our communion with God. That is our conversation with Allah. And that's why, what do we do before we pray? إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَغْسِلُوا What do we do before we pray? We make wudu. Because we're preparing to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, after that, the Prophet ﷺ then says that they brought an animal to me. The creature was... It was larger than a donkey, but it was smaller than a mule. And it was white in color. And they, asked, and they introduced the Prophet ﷺ to this creature. They said, Hada Buraq. This is an animal, a creature called Buraq. And this is the ride or the transportation of the Prophets. The Prophet ﷺ was then requested, please climb, on, climb aboard this creature. When the Prophet ﷺ initially started to climb aboard the animal, the animal started to buck a little bit, started to resist a little. And it's a very beautiful moment <clears throat> that Jibreel ﷺ, he says to the creature that you are behaving this way with Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. Do you know who this is? Do you realize who this person is? And immediately, the narration mentions that the animal became very calm. Abi Muhammad in Taf'al, Hada, you're behaving this way with Muhammad Sallallahu and the animal immediately became calm, recognizing even the animal, the creature recognized the station of the Prophet Sallallahu the status of the Prophet Sallallahu That's why the, in authentic narrations, the Prophet Sallallahu when he returned back to Mecca, at the time of the conquest of Mecca, he walked by this giant boulder that was like by the side of the road. And the Prophet Sallallahu in Hadith of Bukhari says, Inni la a'rifu al hajar. I recognize this stone, this boulder, this rock that I never really understood why, but whenever I used to walk past it, it would say salam to me. Animals and creatures would come seeking affection from the Prophet This camel one time, the owner of the camel was being very rough with it. And the Prophet reprimanded the man. And he said, don't you fear Allah, you treat this creature this way? And the animal was groaning and moaning. And when the Prophet placed his hand on the animal's head, it immediately became quiet. The Sahaba say, we used to see the Prophet would be walking and like animals would run up to the Prophet ﷺ and they would lower themselves in front of him. So the animal immediately became calm. This is the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ then boarded the animal 
and they began the journey. The Prophet ﷺ says that the animal moved at the speed of light. It would take one step and its step would land as far as your eye could see. And there are a few things, very powerful, beautiful things that occurred with the Prophet ﷺ on this journey. On his way to Jerusalem. That there were very strategic stops. Or at points it would slow down and the Prophet ﷺ was shown something. The first thing was that as soon as they started moving, within a second, the animal stopped. And the Prophet ﷺ says that the animal moved so fast that it would take a step as far as the eye could see. And he said, when I looked over, I saw that Jibreel was right by my side. That's how fast Jibreel ﷺ is. And he said that the animal stopped and Jibreel ﷺ requested me, please get down from the animal and pray two rakahs here. So the Prophet ﷺ did that. He got down from the animal and he prayed two rakahs. And then he said, go ahead and board the animal. The Prophet, and then he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Do you understand? Do you realize where you just prayed? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I don't know. And Jibreel ﷺ told the Prophet ﷺ, Ardun tayyiba wa ilayha al-muhajar. You just prayed in a beautiful place and one day someone will move to this place. And it was Medina. Then they boarded the animal and again it started moving very fast and very quickly. And then again the animal was stopped. And the Prophet ﷺ was requested to get down and pray. And when he got down and prayed, and he said, do you know where you just prayed? And he said, no. He said, this is the place where God spoke to Moses. And then he rode the animal again, and it stopped very soon. And then the Prophet ﷺ was asked, do you know where you just prayed? He was asked to pray there, and he said, do you know where you prayed? And he said, no. And he said that you have just prayed in Beit Laham, the place of the miraculous birth of Isa a.s. Bethlehem. And then when he rode the animal again, they arrived in Jerusalem. But before we start talking about what happened at Jerusalem, the second thing that I wanted to mention that the Prophet ﷺ witnessed and experienced was that the Prophet ﷺ was shown a couple of very remarkable, beautiful things that there are profound lessons in. The animal slowed down at a place and the Prophet, that place was overcome with this beautiful fragrance Unlike anything the Prophet ﷺ had ever experienced before. It was beautiful. And he asked Jibreel ﷺ, what is this remarkable fragrance? And the Prophet ﷺ, and Jibreel ﷺ commented that this is the place where Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, who believed in Musa ﷺ, and defied a tyrant who was her husband. And ultimately he killed her for it. The Qur'an speaks about this. That this is the place where she is buried and this fragrance is from her burial place. That we were shown, we are learning through this experience of the Prophet ﷺ of how beloved someone is to Allah when they have sacrificed for the sake of Allah. That that kind of faith and loyalty and commitment to Allah how it is rewarded by Allah. Then the Prophet ﷺ, as he was riding, once again, the animal was slowed down. And the Prophet ﷺ was told to look down. And when he looked down, he was given the ability to see through the earth, through the ground. And he was gazing upon the place where Musa ﷺ is buried. And he saw that Musa ﷺ was praying to Allah within his grave. And once again, this was to emphasize the, st the status and the connection that Musa alayhi salam has to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third thing was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this journey, he was shown certain rewards of good people and certain punishments of people who defied and disobeyed Allah. And some of this will be a little bit heavy but nonetheless, it's a very important lesson that has been preserved for us, so we will talk about it. First and foremost, the Prophet ﷺ was shown that there were these people that they are planting a seed in the ground. 
And the second that they put the seed in the ground and they cover it with dirt, immediately, instantaneously, the plant shoots out of it. Okay? Kind of like just an immediate reward. And the Prophet asked Jibreel, that is remarkable. What is that? And Jibreel السلام, told the Prophet These are the people that strove and struggled in the path of God. These are the people that worked and made sacrifices and efforts to spread the deen and the religion of Allah. That Allah multiplies their reward and Allah will give them their reward immediately. The Prophet وسلم, then saw the other side. He was shown on his way to Bayt al Maqdis that there's a group of people, Qawman, Turkhadu ru'usuhum bis sakhar, Kullama rudikhat, aadat kama kanat, La yufattaru anhum min dhalika shayun. There's this group of people, this is a part that's heavy. Their head is being bashed in with a rock. Their heads are being crushed with these rocks. And after their heads are crushed, then their head is returned back to normal. And then it happens over and over and over again. And they're not able to escape this fate. And the Prophet ﷺ with such pain and concern, he said, Ya Jibreel, man ha'ula? Who are these people? Why is this happening to them? And Jibreel alayhi salam said, Ha'ula illadina tatathaqalu ru'usuhum inda salah. These were the people that were too busy to pray to Allah. These were people who thought they were too important. They were too busy. They had more important things to do than to worship Allah and pray to Allah. And this is their fate. May Allah protect us all. There's another group of people the Prophet ﷺ sees. <clears throat> they are eating these very like terrible things. Um, these thorny, you know, really horrific looking like plants. And as they eat them, it's basically tearing through them and tearing out of their body. Their entrails are trailing behind them. Their innards are trailing behind them. It's very horrific. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw that, he said, Man ha'ula ya Jibreel? Who are these people? Why is this happening to them? And he said, ha'ula illadina la yu'adduna sadaqata amwalihim. These were the people who were too preoccupied with their own lives to give charity. Allah gave them, and Allah gave them, and Allah gave them. And they had every luxury anyone could ever want. They had food, they had a roof over their head, they had clothes on, they had everything. But they wouldn't give charity in the way of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ also saw that there were these people that their تُقْرَضُ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ وَشِفَاهُهُمْ بِمَقَارِيدْ مِنْ نَارِ their tongues were being cut out and their lips were being sliced off with these scissors that were red hot burning from fire. It's like as if they were on fire. And after that would occur, then they would be returned back to normal and then it would be inflicted on them over and over and over again. And the Prophet said, Ya Jibreel, man ha'ula? Who are these people? Why is this happening? And the Prophet ﷺ said, هَؤُلَاءِ خُطَبَاءُ مِنْ أُمَّتِكْ These were people that went around and gave everybody else lectures and advice. يَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرْ They would tell people what's right and wrong. وَيَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَهُمْ But they forgot themselves. They preached that which they themselves did not practice. وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ and they could read. They were educated. They were knowledgeable. But they were hypocrites. They told other people what to do, but they didn't concern themselves. They didn't concern themselves with their own condition, that this is their punishment. And then there's a number of different punishments that are mentioned, but I'll suffice with that here. 
And I'll, con I'll pause it here and then we'll continue on. But a very important lesson that we have to take from this is that the Prophet ﷺ on this night was shown the reward that if we make an effort to worship Allah, to strive for Allah, to have a relationship with Allah, we try to serve Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will re multiply our reward many, many fold. But on the flip side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not demanded a lot from us. Allah has told us to pray to Him. Allah has told us to give charity. Allah has told us to practice what we preach, to not backbite others, to not kill, to not fornicate, to not steal. A handful of things. But when we don't concern ourselves with that, when we violate these things and we start to live life just for our own gratification and the fulfillment of our own desires, then we were given a preview and a glimpse of the punishment that awaits and the horrific fate that awaits. May Allah protect us all. So this, while we learn about this night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, we will marvel at the story. And we will really, you know, enjoy and, and benefit from the, the experience of the Prophet ﷺ. But it's very important to also take the lessons from it and realize how we can implement this within our own lives. So inshallah, in the spirit of that, we're going to pause. We'll have the adhan. We'll pray Salat al-Maghrib and inshallah, after Salat al-Maghrib, we'll resume the session. Jazakumullah khairan.
بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين So we were talking about the Prophet ﷺ's journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And one of the things that we specifically talked about was how the Prophet ﷺ witnessed some of the rewards of the people that did good, but also the Prophet ﷺ witnessed some of the punishments that were afflicted upon people who had committed some of the major sins. And... Some of the narrations mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ started the ascension, there were some more of these kind of punishments that were shown to the Prophet ﷺ. And I won't go through all the details, but I did want to mention, highlight some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ specifically witnessed. He specifically witnessed the punishment that was given to Akhlatu Amwali Yatama Dhulman. He specifically witnessed the punishment inflicted upon the people who consume the wealth of orphans. Because what a grave crime it is. The Prophet ﷺ specifically witnessed the punishments that were being inflicted upon al-mukhtabun, hal al-mukhtabin, the people who talked about other people behind their backs, committed the crime of backbiting, ghibah. And so once again, it's a very powerful reminder of the fact that many of the indiscretions that we have, many of the shortcomings that we have between us and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very forgiving and very merciful. But when it specifically comes to violating the rights of other people, that is an area, that is a domain in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not just blanketly, just automatically forgive people and excuse that behavior. But there will be accountability when it comes to the rights of other people. And that's why we have to be so cautious and careful that we have to learn to never violate, never cross the line when it comes to other people, their rights, their dignity, their honor, their property, let alone their lives. And that's a, there's a very serious warning about that within our religion. So now, the Prophet ﷺ riding the Buraq with Jibreel ﷺ by his side, the Prophet ﷺ in what feels like just moments, he arrives at Baytul Maqdis, Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Jerusalem. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived there, Sheikh Mikail was talking about it, but I want to remind all of us this is at a point in time where the heart of the Prophet ﷺ was very heavy to say the least. His heart was broken. He had lost his wife of over 25 years, the mother of his children, his best friend, the first one to believe in him and support him. His everything, Khadija radiallahu anha. He had lost Abu Talib, the man who raised him. When he had lost his father, his mother, his grandfather. The man who basically became his whole family and raised him and supported him through thick and thin. And then particularly died, left this world without accepting the message of the Prophet ﷺ. He was heartbroken. Allah had to console him. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ You can't guide whom you love. Allah guides whomsoever He wills. And then the first time the Prophet ﷺ made this effort to go outside of Mecca and see what the reception would be somewhere else. Forget about there being no reception. They turned on Him. They stoned Him. For three miles, they threw rocks at Him. Until He bled so profusely from His body that the blood soaked into his sandals and dried and glued his sandals to his feet. Think about what he's going through. And at that moment, now <clears throat> try to imagine the most difficult moment of your life. Imagine the most heartbreaking 
point in your life where it feels like the sun may never rise again. And then, not one or two, but hundreds of thousands of your brothers, your friends, they show up to console you and comfort you, to encourage you. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived at Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Jibreel salam takes the Prophet ﷺ, he touches a place in the wall, and this ring emerges from the wall, and he says, tie your, the burak here. This is where the prophets would tie their animals when they would come to Al-Aqsa. And <clears throat> the masjid that's present in the Aqsa compound till today, known as Masjid al-Buraq, basically commemorates that, that place. The Prophet ﷺ tied the animal there. It's in a corner of the compound. And then when Jibreel Alayhi brought the Prophet ﷺ into the middle of the compound, the Prophet ﷺ was greeted by every single Prophet and Messenger that ever lived. One narration in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad states there were over a hundred thousand Prophets. Another narration mentions over three hundred thousand Prophets. All of them were gathered there together. Just try to internalize, try to put yourself in the place of the Prophet ﷺ. How beautiful that must have been. How encouraging and empowering that must have been. All of them came together for me. To be here for me. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, فَحَانَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَأَمَّمْتُهُمْ The Prophet ﷺ says, Then came the time of the prayer. Like it was time to pray. Jibreel ﷺ said, We will offer a prayer together. And the Prophet ﷺ says, I was made to lead all of them in prayer. To honor the Prophet ﷺ. His own forefather, Ibrahim ﷺ is there. The Prophet about whom the Prophet ﷺ has, you know, so much of the revelation has been talking about him. Musa salam, he's there. The Prophet who walked these same grounds, Isa salam is there. The Prophet who led prayers there, once upon a time, Zakariya salam, he's there. The father of all of humanity, Adam salam, is there. But who leads the prayer? The Prophet ﷺ does. And after he led all the prophets in prayer, the narration even beautifully mentions, ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ فَإِذَا النَّبِيُّونَ أَجْمَعُونَ يُصَلُّونَ مَعَهُ After he got done leading the prayer as is the sunnah, the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, he would turn and face his congregation after he was done leading the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ led the prayer and when he turned and faced the congregation, he again soaked it in and took it in that all the prophets, every single prophet throughout time was gathered there praying behind him. After that, Jibreel alayhi salam, he requested the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the time has now come for you to ascend into the heavens. And this is the second part of that night, the second part of this story, this narrative, this journey, and that is al-mi'raj, the ascension. So, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Thumma akhada biyadi." Jibril alaihi salam held my hand. Fa'ara jabi ila sama, and then he started to ascend into the sky, holding my hand. He took me with him until we ascended into the heavens, into the sky, and left this worldly realm. And when we got to the gate that is that separates this worldly realm from the unseen realm, there was a gate. And there was a khazin, khazin sama There was a gatekeeper, an angel. And Jibreel alayhi salam says to the gatekeeper, he says, iftah, open the gates. The gatekeeper doing his job, protocol, he says, man anta. Who's there? 
Jibreel alayhi salam, he answered, he said, Jibreel, it's Gabriel. He said, man ma'ak, there's someone with you. Who do you bring with you? And Jibreel alayhi salam says, Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The gatekeeper, this is an angel of God who keeps, who is the gatekeeper of the heavens. He becomes excited. He says, Awaqadu ursila ilayhi? It's time? It's here? Today's the day? And what that tells you is, from the moment this universe was created, from the moment that this world was created, this worldly realm, the moment that that gate was placed there, the moment that angel was assigned there, from that day, they knew that there will come a very special day. And on that very special day, a very special, remarkable person, Muhammad Rasulullah wasallam, the most beloved of Allah's creation to him, will come and visit here one day. He will pass through this gate one day. And only Allah knows how long ago that was. But from that moment till this night that we are reading about, the angels had awaited that special moment. And so he says, it's time. He says, Naam, it's time. Yes. And the angel opens the gates. And he says, Marhaban bihi. Welcome, welcome. Fani'mal maji uja'a. This is the greatest arrival. You are the greatest guest that we have ever received. And the Prophet ﷺ says that we crossed into the first stage of the heavens. And he said that when we crossed in there, when we arrived there, I met a man. He was sitting. And to the right of him, it was glowing. To the left of him, it seemed like there was darkness, no light. And when he would look to the right where it was glowing, he would smile. When he would look to the left where it was dark and an absence of light, he would cry. And he says that I asked, O oh, Jibreel, who's this man? And he said, this is Adam alayhi salam. And Jibreel alayhi salam told the Prophet sallallahu what the light on his right, what that represents is the people from his progeny, the human beings, the children of Adam, the human beings that will do good and that will be righteous. And that's why when he looks to his right, he smiles. And the darkness, the absence of light on his left, that represents his progeny, the children of Adam who disobeyed and defied Allah. And when he looks there, he cries because of the sadness that his children went astray. Jibreel alayhi salam goes and introduces the Prophet sallallahu to Adam alayhi salam. Hada abuka Adam. Adam alayhi salam greets the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam responded to his greeting. And then he said, Marhaban bil ibn salih wa nabi salih. Welcome, welcome to my most righteous son and the most righteous prophet. Then Jibreel alayhi salam tells, and then he made dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Da'a lahu Then Jibreel alayhi salam told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to continue. And they ascended to the second stage of the heavens. And what's interesting is that at every stage of the heavens, the same interaction would take place. There's a gate. There's a gatekeeping angel. The Jibreel alayhi salam would go and knock on the gate. The angel would say, who's there? He would say, this is Jibreel. He says, someone's with you. He, said, he would say, yes, it's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the angel would once again become excited. <gasps> it's him. It's time. It's today. And then they would open the gates and they would welcome the Prophet ﷺ with a grand welcome. So when they enter into the second stage of the heavens, the Prophet ﷺ says, There I saw the two cousins, Ibn al-Khala, the two cousins, Yahya 
علیہ السلام the son of Zakaria and Isa علیہ السلام the son of Maryam and the Prophet ﷺ, they said salam to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ responded to their salam and then they welcomed the Prophet ﷺ. Marhaban bil akhi salih wa nabi salih wa da'awa li bi khayrin. They greeted the Prophet ﷺ by saying, Welcome, welcome to our most righteous brother and welcome to the most righteous Prophet. And then they made dua for the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ proceeded to the third stage of the heavens. When he arrived there, he says that I met none other than the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. I greeted him, or he greeted me, and I responded to his greeting. And then he welcomed me by again saying, Welcome to my most righteous brother and the most righteous Prophet. He made dua for me. And the Prophet sallam tells us, he says, فَإِذَا هُوَ قَدْ أُعْطِيَ شَطْرَ الْحُسْنِ The Prophet sallam said he was the most striking, captivating human being I've ever seen in my entire life. Half the beauty of the world was contained within that one man. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. He was so remarkable, so captivating. Then they proceed on to the fourth stage of the heavens. There the Prophet ﷺ is greeted by the Prophet Idris salam, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We gave, we elevated him. So he was greeted, he greets the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ responds to his greeting. He welcomes the Prophet ﷺ and makes dua for him. And then from there they continue on to the fifth stage of the heavens. Where once the Prophet ﷺ enters there, he's greeted by Harun alayhi salam. And there's a very interesting, there's different reflections that the scholars have shared why he was meeting certain prophets at certain stages. He met Adam alayhi salam at the beginning because again, Adam alayhi salam is the father of all of humanity as kind of the foundation. He met Yahya and Isa alayhi salam because they were both persecuted and oppressed by their people. That the Prophet ﷺ was give, being given that consolation that some of your own people will turn against you. He was greeted by Yusuf alayhi salam. Because Yusuf alayhi salam even dealt with difficulty from within the family. And the Prophet ﷺ was being told, you will deal with difficulty even from within your own family. Tabatiya da Abi Lahab. He was greeted by Idris alayhi salam that in spite of all of this, Allah will elevate your status. And this one particularly really touches my heart. He was then greeted by Harun alayhi salam. Why? Because when Musa alayhi salam was given the one the most, was given one of the toughest responsibilities that any human being has ever been given. And that was to go stand in the court of a tyrant, the palace of the tyrant, and speak truth to the face of this tyrant and to take him on and challenge him and his entire kingdom. Musa alayhi salam said, Oh Allah, I need some help and support. Harun akhi, ushdud bihi azri, wa ashrik hufi amri. I need some support. Give me my brother Harun with me. And the Prophet ﷺ was given an even tougher responsibility. And that was, bashiran wa nadira. All of humanity is your responsibility. And the Prophet ﷺ was provided help and support. Just like Musa ﷺ was provided help and support with Harun ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ was provided help and support in the form of not one person, but an entire generation of people that we call the Sahaba. Allah was telling the Prophet ﷺ on that night, you will not be on this mission alone. You will have an entire community of people, men, women, children, elderly, who will fight by your side, who will put their lives on the line for you. They will cry with you, they will laugh with you, they will pray with you. They will never leave your side. Muhammadur Rasulullahi walladheena ma'ahu They will always be with you. And they were loyal to the Prophet ﷺ till the very end, as we're going to be talking about a little bit later tonight. So he meets Harun alayhi salam, he welcomes him and makes dua for him. Then the Prophet ﷺ is taken up to the sixth stage of the heavens, where he meets none other than the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And this is 
beautiful in and of itself. Why? Because the most frequently talked about Prophet in the entire Quran is Musa alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is finally meeting in person the same Prophet that he has been reciting all the verses of the Quran about. And he meets with him. And he interacts with him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam describes him that he was a very strong man. And he describes how he looked that he had a darker complexion and he had very curly hair. And he was a very broad-shouldered, strong man. After the Prophet ﷺ departs from the sixth stage of the heavens, the narration actually mentions, Musa ﷺ seems sad. And when the angels asks him, that's, why are you so sad? And he said, what makes me sad are my people. That I tried so hard. And Allah sent so many miracles and signs. But most of them did not believe. And this little brother of mine that I just met, more people from his followers will enter paradise than from my followers. So I'm sad about the condition and the state of my people. Then the Prophet ﷺ proceeds to the seventh and the final stage of the heavens. And there he is greeted by none other than Khalilullah Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Prophet ﷺ describes what he sees. He says that there is a Kaaba-like structure on the seventh stage of the heavens. It's called Al-Baytul Ma'mur. Allah swears by it in the Quran, Wal-Baytul Ma'mur. And it's a place where the angels worship. They do tawaf there. And the Prophet ﷺ, there's a verse in the Quran which Allah says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو No one realizes the scope of the army of God except for him. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ told us at that place, Baytul Ma'mur, 70,000 angels every single day perform tawaf of Al-Baytul Ma'mur. And once an angel has had the opportunity to do tawaf, they never get a second chance. Every day, every day, 70,000 new angels perform tawaf there. We can't even do the math. Right? Ask ChatGPT that question. <laughs> Nonsense. All right? So, and the Prophet ﷺ describes, he says, Ibrahim ﷺ is sitting, musnidan dhahrahu ila al-bayt al maru Ibrahim ﷺ is sitting there, he's so captivating. He's sitting there leaning against al-bayt al mamur And he sees the Prophet ﷺ and he smiles at the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, welcome, welcome son. I've been, wel I've been waiting for you. And he asks the Prophet ﷺ to sit down with him. And... The, this was such a special moment for the Prophet ﷺ that he narrates a hadith of Tirmidhi. لَقِيتُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَيْلَةَ أُسْرِيَ بِي I got to meet Ibrahim. And he said, Ya Muhammad. He said, listen. أَقْرِي أُمَّتَكَ مِنِّي السلام. Tell your ummah, I said salam to them. Ibrahim salam gave us salam. وَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ طَيِّبَةُ التُرْبَى and tell them that paradise is extremely fertile soil. عَذَبَةُ ma, Its water is very sweet. وَأَنَّهَا qiyan. However, its land, it's, open, it's an open field. وَأَنَّ غِرَاسَهَا It needs trees planted. And the way that trees are planted in paradise is when your ummah says, Subhanallah, Everyone repeat, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. That when your ummah says these beautiful words of praise and glorification of Allah that plants trees in paradise. After this, the Prophet ﷺ departs from there. And Jibreel salam takes the Prophet ﷺ to get a preview and a glimpse of paradise. The Prophet ﷺ says, فِيهَا حَبَائِ اللُّؤْلُؤْ وَإِذَا تُرَابُهَا الْمِسْكُ I saw that there were mounds of pearls. And I saw that there, the, the, the dirt of paradise was musk. 
I saw like the Quran mentions that there are rivers and streams flowing in paradise of clean water, of milk that never goes bad, of wine that is not evil and intoxicating, and of pure honey. That I saw that there were palaces in paradise. A brick of gold on top of a brick of silver and the cement in between was musk. I saw that there were palaces in paradise that were so huge that they had 70,000 rooms and the whole palace was carved out of a singular pearl. And then finally the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith found in Bukhari he mentions what Allah said, In Allah qada a'adda li ibadihi as salihin ma la aynun ra'at, wa la udhunun sami'at, wa la khatara ala qalbi bashar. That Allah has prepared for His beloved slaves, His righteous servants in paradise, that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no mind or heart can comprehend. It's how remarkable it is. Then the Prophet ﷺ was shown the fountain of Al Kawthar, which ataytu ala nahrin hafatahu qibabul lu'lu'i mujawwafan. That I came upon a stream, a fountain, and the fountain was surrounded by all these gems. And the Prophet ﷺ was told, هَذَا الْكَوْثَرَ الَّذِي أَعْطَاكَهُ اللَّهِ This is the fountain of Kawthar that Allah gave you as a gift and you will serve water from this fountain to your followers. And then, while the Prophet ﷺ is being given this tour of paradise, the Prophet ﷺ says that when I was in paradise, سَمِعَتُ فِي جَانِبِهَا وَجِسًا the Prophet ﷺ said that he heard some kind of sound, like footsteps. Like if somebody's walking kind of maybe above you, you can hear the person walking. This is paradise. Not your apartment. Why can I hear somebody stomping around? And he said, Jibreel, what's this? And Jibreel ﷺ said, Hada Bilalun al Mu'addin. This is Bilal. That's when he walks on the earth, his footsteps echo in the heavens. And the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ بِلَالَ قَدْ أَفْلَحَ بِلَالَ Bilal is successful, Bilal is successful. That is real success. We worry about what our status is in this dunya. This man's footsteps echo in paradise. That's status. And the Prophet ﷺ even Asked Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, Ya Bilal, haditni bi arja amalin ameltahu indaka fil islami manfa'atan, fa inni sami'atu laylata khashfana alayka bayna yaday fil jannah. He said, What deed is it that you do that I hear your footsteps echoing in paradise? And Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, That every single time, whether it be night or day, like during the daytime, if I lose my wudu, or in the nighttime, if I wake up, I immediately make wudu. And every single time I make wudu, I make sure even if it's not time for one of the obligatory prayers, I just pray two rakahs to Allah. That's the one deed that I have, Ya Rasulullah. So once again, the moral of the story comes back to this prayer, comes back to the salah, comes back to our connection to Allah, comes back to our relationship with Allah. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. Finally, the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel ﷺ, takes the Prophet ﷺ to a point. And when he takes him there, then Jibreel ﷺ stops, and the Prophet ﷺ keeps walking, and he turns around and he says, Jibreel, come on. Right? He's been with him this whole night on this journey. So he says, Why are you stopping? Let's go. And Jibreel alayhi salam tells the Prophet, وسلم, No. This is where I stop and you continue on from. That this is the place of Sidratul Muntaha. Sidra refers to a tree. Muntaha refers to the limit. There's a tree marking that place where it is the limit of where creation can go, even Jibreel. 
And he said that you are the only creation of Allah to ever be invited past this and you are to go. The Prophet ﷺ says that he went forward under the shade of the tree and he was, it was inspired within his heart by Allah to fall into sujood. He went into sajda and the tree wrapped around him and closed him. And once that tree enclosed him and separated him from all the realm of creation, the Prophet ﷺ says that he was then in the presence of Allah. And there he had a conversation with Allah. And what's really interesting is that there are some things that come out of that conversation that we're going to touch on here. But the Qur'an, the way it talks about it, it really again just strikes me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدَنَا ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدَنَا He went near to Allah and then Allah says, he, Allah drew him even closer. And until the distance between the Prophet ﷺ and Allah was the distance of two bows, like a bow and arrow. And that's kind of an expression in the Arabic language. When you want to say two things are very close, you say the distance between them is qawsain. The distance of two bows, like two feet. O adana. Or Allah says, or maybe he was closer. Basically, Allah is saying, none of your beeswax. Right? This is an A and B conversation. See yourself out. Right? Allah is saying that this is the time when Allah spoke to his Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, this has been mentioned previously. I read the verses in the prayer, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى That at the time when our hearts are broken, at the time when we feel broken, that is when we experience nearness to Allah. The time when the Prophet ﷺ, according to worldly descriptions, how we would describe it, he lost everything. He achieved nearness to Allah unlike anything anyone has ever experienced before or after. And it was at the moment when he was hurting the most. And it's very important for us to remember that we cannot let despair overtake us and overcome us in moments of difficulty and adversity. But that's the time when we want to connect with Allah. Because that's the time when we'll taste the sweetness of our faith. And he had a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are two things. There are many, many things. There's a narration that mentions Surah Al-Fatiha was specifically given to the Prophet ﷺ there again. The last concluding verses of Surah Al-Baqarah were given to him there again. But there are two, there are many, many gifts, but there are two things very specifically I wanted to mention. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ, I will give you a gift for your ummah. And what is the because Allah the Prophet ﷺ was there praying for us. So Allah said, I will give your ummah a gift. What is the gift? Okay. Follow closely. Whenever anyone from your followers, a Muslim, makes the intention to do a good deed, I will tell the angels to write down a good deed for that person. وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا And I have promised that every deed shall be multiplied ten times. Then if the person actually follows through with doing the good deed that they intended to do, I will command the angels to write another good deed for the person. And every good deed is multiplied ten times. But when the person makes the intention to commit a sin, I will tell the angels not to write down a sin. And if the person goes through with committing the sin, then the angels are instructed to only write one sin. And that will not be multiplied. And if the person repents immediately, it will be wiped out. But if the person makes the intention to commit a sin, and then does not commit the sin, 
I will command the angels to write down a good deed because resisting temptation is a good deed. And every good deed is multiplied ten times. That is my gift, Allah said. And the second gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet for us is that your ummah will pray salah, the prayer, 50 times a day. The Prophet ﷺ, he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these gifts, praised and glorified Allah. Then he says that the tree opened up. The Prophet ﷺ was in sujood. He got up from sujood. Jibreel ﷺ was waiting for him. He went to Jibreel and they began the journey back. They passed through the seventh heaven, saying salam to Ibrahim salam. They made it down to the sixth stage of the heavens, where once again they met Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam, when they said salam, Musa alayhi salam stopped the Prophet salam and he said, what'd you get? <laughs> so he says, I got 50 prayers in a day. Musa alayhi salam said, that's too much. He goes, I know people. And he said that they're not going to be able to do this. You need to go back and have it decreased. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay. This also tells you, it's important to listen to counsel and advice from people that have more experience than you. Who does the Prophet ﷺ need advice from? Nobody. But he recognizes the fact that my big brother, he's got more experience than I do. So the Prophet ﷺ goes back to the place, to the tree. He falls down in sujood again. And is talking to Allah again. And he says, Ya Allah, khaffif an ummati. Please lighten the burden upon my ummah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have removed five prayers, 45 prayers in a day. The Prophet ﷺ praises and glorifies Allah. He begins to come back. Once again, when he reaches the sixth stage of the heavens, Musa alayhi salam says, all right, what's the update? And he says, 45 prayers now. He goes, that's too much. You have to go back. The Prophet ﷺ goes back, falls in sujood again, talks to Allah, says, Ya Allah, please make the load lighter for my ummah. He says, I have removed five prayers, 40 prayers. He comes back. Musa ﷺ says, what's the update? He says, 40 prayers. He goes, that's too much. You have to go back. He goes back, talks to Allah again. Says, oh Allah, make it lighter for my ummah. He says, what's the... So Allah says, 35 prayers now. He comes back. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? 35 prayers. He says, it's still too much. The Prophet ﷺ goes back. He prays again. He talks to Allah again. He says, please lighten the burden from my ummah. He says, okay, 30 prayers in a day. The Prophet ﷺ comes back. He meets Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? He says, 30 prayers. He says, it's too much. You have to go back. He goes back to Allah. Talks to Allah. Lighten the burden on my ummah. He says 25 prayers in a day. The Prophet ﷺ is returning, stops at Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? He says 25 prayers. He says that that's still too much. Go back. He goes back, talks to Allah again. Oh Allah, please lighten the burden for my ummah. He says now it's 20 prayers in a day. He comes returning back. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? He says 20 prayers. He says that's still too much. You have to go back again. He goes back, talks to Allah. Says, oh Allah, please make things easier for my ummah. He says 15 prayers in a day. He's returning back. Musa alayhi salam stops him. What's the update? He says 15 prayers. He goes, it's too much. You have to go back. For your ummah's sake, go back. He goes and talks to Allah again. He says, oh Allah, please make it easier for my ummah. He says 10 prayers in a day. The Prophet salam is returning back. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? He says 10 prayers. He says, that's too much. You have to go back. Think of your people. The Prophet salam goes back. Falls in sujood, prays to Allah, talks to Allah. Says, please, O oh Allah, lighten the burden on my ummah. Have mercy on them. Allah says five prayers in a day. Whoever will pray five will get the reward of 50. The Prophet ﷺ is returning back. Passes through the seventh stage of the heavens. Gives salam to Ibrahim ﷺ. salam. Goes to the sixth stage of the heavens. Says salam to Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam says, what's the update? He says five prayers in a day. He says it's too much. My ummah only had to pray twice a day and they had trouble with that. Go back. And he says, no, I'm not going back again. That's enough. Now, I wanted to 
point out something. I went through and mentioned from 50 to 45 to 40 to 35 to 30 to 25 to 20 to 15 to 10 to 5. Somebody was probably thinking you could just say he kept going back until it got down to 5. Because you got tired of hearing five prayers at a time decreasing, but the Prophet did not get tired of going back and asking on our behalf. He went back again and again and again. Think about it. Wouldn't you feel shy and embarrassed to go back to somebody repeatedly to keep asking for favors? But he wasn't shy. First of all, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most kind and generous. We never, this is a demonstration of what our relationship with Allah needs to be like. Go to Allah all the time, every time, any time, every single time, go to Allah. Allah will never tire of you asking Him. He will never tire of giving to you. It's us who get distracted or get bored. Because we're silly little creatures. But Allah never gets tired. Number two, think about how much the Prophet ﷺ loved us. That he went back on our behalf over and over and over and over and over. How much he loved us. How much he cared about us. And so this prayer of the, this gift of the five prayers was given at that time. And the Prophet ﷺ then returns back, passes through all the stages of the heavens, and Jibreel ﷺ escorts the Prophet ﷺ all the way to Jerusalem from where the Prophet ﷺ boards the Buraq once again, and Jibreel ﷺ accompanies the Prophet ﷺ all the way back to Al Masjid Al Haram in Mecca. And all of this transpires within the night. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he goes home to check on Fatima. And there's just this energy about him. He's just beaming and glowing. That Umm Hani notices it. And she says, What's something, something's happened. And she's a believer. And he says, yes, something's happened. And he tells her. And then he says, I have to go and tell everyone about it. And she, for a moment, just out of concern for the Prophet ﷺ, she says, no, no, don't go tell everybody. Because there are some bad people out there that are going to try to exploit the situation and make, try to make a mockery of you. But the Prophet ﷺ says, no, I have to tell everyone. And that's the journey of al-Isra wal miraj The journey by night from Mecca to Jerusalem and then the ascension above the heavens and the return back. From here... What we're going to talk about going forward is when the Prophet ﷺ returned back and basically told the story, then what that moment and what that interaction was like. Also, uh, I forgot to mention, when the Prophet ﷺ was returning back, he saw some things on the way that ultimately ended up being a proof and an evidence. For instance, the Prophet ﷺ saw that there was a caravan that they had been waiting in Mecca for a while that was returning back. And the Prophet ﷺ told them that this caravan is almost back and it will be back today. And some kind of delay happened and they weren't able to get back. They, they for a while looked like they weren't going to make it back that day. And if nighttime came, they were just going to have to camp out outside of Mecca. So the narration mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed the setting of the sun to the point where the people in Mecca started kind of freaking out a little bit like, why won't this day end? <laughs> right? So until those people could arrive back. The Prophet ﷺ on the way, he saw that there was a caravan that was coming back, a group of people, and they were stopped somewhere. Why? Because they were all searching for a camel that they had lost. And the Prophet ﷺ saw that the camel was, you know, in the next valley over. And when they arrived back, when the Prophet ﷺ got back and then that caravan returned back, the Prophet ﷺ said, you guys lost your camel, didn't you? He's like, yeah, how'd you know? He said, I saw it. And you found it in the next valley over, right? They're like, oh my God, how's he doing this? And the Prophet ﷺ said, because I saw that you found it over there. So there was these proofs and evidences as well. But inshallah, I'll go ahead and pause here. And I'm going to ask, um, inshallah, uh, try and find somebody. Sure. Do you know? 
Let me try to locate somebody. Okay, so inshallah, we're going to be continuing what we're going to have inshallah to close out the evening. What we might end up doing, uh, just as a heads up to everyone, is that we might end up uh, praying Salat al-Isha a little bit later than we normally do. Normally we have Isha at 8.15, so we might push it a little bit as needed inshallah to complete the program, to conclude the program. Um, don't worry, Isha time goes all the way till Fajr, so you'll be fine. Um, but uh, inshallah, we're going to have... Uh, Two more sessions, inshallah. They'll be a little bit shorter. My session was, uh, unfortunately, a little bit longer because I had to cover the narrative of the Isra wal Mi'raj and Ustada Fatima's uh, flight did not get back in time. She was out of town, so I had to cover her portion. I apologize. Um, but um, inshallah, uh, Ustad Murphy will be talking to us about the Prophet ﷺ returning back and then basically telling the story of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj and what were the reactions of the people to hearing the story. And then inshallah, we'll conclude by hearing from Mufti Kamani. Mufti Kamani will talk to us about some of the lessons and the takeaways and the blessings of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. You know what, if I'm, if, that, that's a great thing to do when I'm the speaker. <laughs> you know what, I'll put it right back. Yeah. And bring it a little bit closer. Man. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Watch this. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Sorry, one second. I was just speaking with Mufti Kamani. Uh, he's really excited, inshallah, to do his session. So I'm not going to take too long for everybody, inshallah. One second, sorry. Uh, welcome everybody. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is a um, very, you know, important opportunity for us to come together and to learn about the one of the most incredible, uh, momentous occasions in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And, um, you know, most importantly, take some lessons from it, derive some, some actions from it. Uh, because stories are good and reflections are good, but we want to make sure that we walk out of here changed. The goal in any gathering of, of knowledge is that you take something back with you. Just like if somebody went on vacation or went and traveled somewhere and they didn't take any you know, memories with them, it would be a, a very interesting, maybe purposeless vacation. If you couldn't remember you know, the beaches from the West Coast or if you couldn't remember the food from New York City uh, or the smells, right? <laughs> Sorry, East Coasters, right? I'm not talking about the good smells. Uh, or if you couldn't remember, you know, the, the beauty of the sight of the Kaaba when you uh, laid your eyes upon it the first time, or the, the, the serenity and the peace of the green dome in Medina when you visited the Prophet ﷺ. Um, these are what make those moments really, really powerful. And so the memories for gatherings of knowledge are the lessons. That's what we take home, and we hope, inshallah, that these, uh, these lessons stick with us. So the Prophet ﷺ is no stranger to people challenging uh, things that have happened to him. 
The Prophet ﷺ is not somebody that is going to be shocked when people uh, uh, ask him what happened and when he tells them and when they have trouble believing in him. This is, you know, something that he's been going through now uh, for years at this point. And this is actually what led to this, this journey of Al-Isra al-Ma'raj. The Prophet ﷺ, obviously before his uh, messengership, was somebody that was trusted, was somebody that was believed, uh, even if he announced something that was uh, unimaginable, you know, that there were armies approaching the city, the people of Quraysh would have believed him. They said that. They attested to this. But once the Prophet ﷺ came with a message, once he came with an imperative, right? Because information is, it is what it is. But the minute that someone comes to you with some sort of information that asks you to change yourself, that's when people start to debate whether or not they want to believe or trust this person. For example, if I told you right now that outside it was, you know, uh, um, if I told you today that it was outside it was cold or that it was raining or whatever, it wouldn't necessarily like move you emotionally or spiritually. It would just be a piece of information that you had to deal with. But if I gave you some sort of information regarding your faith that in the Quran Allah says this or the Hadith the Prophet says this and as a result of that now we have to change ourselves, we have to practice differently or become different, then that's where people and their nafs kind of start to battle a little bit. So you find that the Prophet ﷺ was a sadiq al-ameen, he was truthful, he was trustworthy, and people had no problem with this up until he started to give them information that would tell them that you have to change your lifestyle, right? That the idolatry, that the immorality, uh, that the, 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 the aggression right, against different uh, 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 marginalized peoples, all of this has to stop. Then people started to go and they started to say, well, we don't know if we really believe that you're a messenger uh, of God. And this is the first time that the Prophet ﷺ had experienced this. So when he comes back from Jerusalem, when he arrives back from Jerusalem, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he actually took rest and he was sleeping in the, in the courtyard of the Haram. He was sleeping in the courtyard of where the Kaaba is. And none other than Abu Jahl walked by him as he was sitting there. He woke up and he was sitting there. And remember, this all happened in, in, the, in the portion of one night. So it's, it's literally bedtime the night before. And then it's time to wake up around, you know, pre-Fajr the next morning. So Abu Jahl comes and he sees him. And he sees that the Prophet Sallallahu has a very distinct face. Like something different happened. It's not just like, oh, normal, like you see him and it's, you can't tell of what day of the week it is. No, there's something very distinct that's different on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. So he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he asks him, he says, what, what happened? What's the matter? What's the issue? And the Prophet ﷺ tells him very bluntly, very directly, he said, last night I was taken from here to Bayt al-Maqtis. I was taken to Al-Quds. And Abu Jahl is ecstatic at this little statement, this piece of information. He's super excited because now he has what he's been waiting for. He thinks that he has this piece of information that's finally going to show everybody that this prophet is not to be trusted, that he is now claiming something that is outright insane. But the interesting thing is that the Prophet ﷺ, when asked this question, he doesn't negotiate. He doesn't waffle. He doesn't go back and forth. He's not trying to sort of decide, is this believable or not? The Prophet ﷺ tells it like it is. And this is lesson number one upon his return, والسلام, is that when you have faith, when you have conviction in Allah, and you come across something that you know, a moment that's going to be diametrically opposed to the faith that you have, the strength of your faith will be on display in that moment to you. And for some of us, these moments are smaller than others, right? Um, you know, I don't normally dress like this. I don't normally wear thobes like out and about in public. Some people do. Mufti Kamani, mashallah, he flies in thobes. All right? He flies in thobes. He's trying to get pulled uh, in security. Anyways, so some people do, and may Allah reward them. May Allah reward I just don't do it because it's not my, it's not, you know, the style that I have. I'll wear whatever I want to wear, but this isn't something that I wear all the time. Now that I have, I'm recovering from a leg injury, it's convenient, but I don't wear it all the time. Okay? But the point being is that when people ask questions like, what are you wearing? Where is that from? Right? There's, there's a way to answer that question that's going to be like the least resistant, and there's a way to answer it that's going to open up a, a new door. Okay, So clothing is one thing. Your name is another thing. Where's your name from? You're like, oh, it's Middle Eastern. <laughs> is it Middle Eastern? Your name's Muhammad, right? Like, 
You know, isn't there a much more meaningful explanation of that name? Isn't there a, 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 um, an explanation or an unpacking of that moment that can bring a lot more substance to that conversation? I understand. Sometimes you don't really want to, you know, tell the, the cashier at Trader Joe's about your name. Right? Sometimes you don't really want to like, start doing like a 15-minute Y Islam course right, at the bank. I understand. But one lesson we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu is that his, in his life, he didn't have a choice. For a lot of us, it's like a moment of convenience. You know, do I want to do dawah or not, right? You're getting your hair cut or whatever, and they're like, so tell me, like, what do you do? And, you know, you know what are you doing on Friday at 1 p.m.? And you're like, oh, man, I got to go to the community center, right? I got to go volunteer my time. There's always a way to sort of answer these questions that will be the least resistant path, that will get you out clearly. The Prophet ﷺ could have said, Abu Jal, what's wrong with you? What's going on? What's your face like that? He could have said nothing. I had, I had a long night. It would have been accurate, right? He had a very long night, okay? But instead, he gives him the truth. And he tells him that last night, I was taken to Jerusalem, and now I'm back here, Okay? What does this mean? When you are put up in a situation where you know in your heart of hearts that what you say in that moment will will echo for a lot longer than the time that it took you to say it, you have to be courageous. You have to do the right thing. And Allah will reward you for that moment and that stand of courage, even if you feel like there's no chance. Allah will reward you for that. And always, especially when it comes to issues of morality and issues of character, never be shy to attribute the beauty that's within you to Allah and his messenger. Don't ever be, jealous. Don't, don't be selfish and try to claim the beauty that, you know, people say, oh, you're so honest. You're so generous. You're so warm and caring. All of these things, we have benefited from our faith in receiving these characteristics. It's not us who are just naturally hospitable and generous. If we didn't know the character of the Prophet ﷺ that had been transferred by a senad that taught us from his time to ours and it was carried actively through our family and our culture. and our, All of Muslim majority countries' cultures are dictated by the example of the Prophet ﷺ. And so this generosity and this, this, this warmth and compassion that people, when they meet you, they might identify it within you. If they don't, then that's an even bigger problem. All right? They're like, hey, Ahmed, you're really cold and rude, right? We should never, ever have that. But if someone identifies being positive, be the person that's courageous enough to attribute that to the Prophet ﷺ. Say that in my faith, in my religion, right, we're taught to do this. We're taught to take care of other people. Why did you always pay for my lunch? Why are you covering my coffee? Right? You don't have to do that. You're like, I know I don't have to do that. But in my faith... We're taught to take care of our friends and colleagues. We're taught to be generous. We're taught to, we're taught to take care of these things and not even take account of it, right? Give it back to the Prophet ﷺ. Give it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Abu Jahl hears this, he becomes obviously ecstatic. And he goes and he calls all of his people, all the people of Quraysh, and he gathers everybody. And they come and Abu Jahl asks the Prophet ﷺ, can you tell everybody again where you went last night? And the Prophet ﷺ starts to... Tell everybody the story of what happened. And we don't have too long again because Mufti Kamani, inshallah, has to come and give his session. But the Prophet ﷺ begins to give an in-depth description of the experience that he had. That I was here and that Angel Jibreel, he came and he saw me and he brought this creature, this winged creature. And that creature carried me. And the, the steps that the creature took were as long as the horizon. And I saw these incredible visions and then I went and I met all the prophets and I led them. He goes the whole story that Sheikh just went over. He went over the whole thing. And as he's narrating this story, as he's telling them, whenever there's like a break in his voice, right? And he's describing Al-Aqsa. So interesting. I don't know if Sheikh described to you this story, this moment. But when they challenge him, there's some people there that have seen. Some people who are, have, have connections with the rabbis and some others who have seen. And they say, describe to us. We've seen it. We've seen uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the Dome of the Rock, and we've seen, tell us what it looks like. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in that moment, I didn't remember what it looked like. Remember, he, he wasn't there on like an a archaeological mission. He was there to go, I mean, he didn't know why he was going, really. Like, Allah took him there. So he wasn't there taking notes on how many windows and how big they were and what color. That wasn't his role. But he said at that moment, because he didn't have 
the, 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 the memory exactly of what everything looked like, he said, subhanAllah, before his eyes, Allah Ta'ala made before him to appear this projection of the very place he was being asked about. And so he was able to describe it down to the, to the, to the granular detail. And as he's describing it, the color in the face of these people who are challenging him, it's like draining from their face. Because they're shocked. They're shocked. And they realize that there's no historical record of Muhammad وسلم, visiting Al-Aqsa. And remember, people knew each other's business very intimately. They knew, right? In tribal societies, you knew everything about where people went, where they didn't go. Because it wasn't like a quick trip. Tonight you can go to Aqsa, come back tomorrow. It's possible with air travel. Back then, you would have been gone for weeks and months, and they would have said, where's Muhammad? And they would have known. So there's no record of the Prophet making these journeys. Okay, And all of a sudden, he's describing down to every last centimeter. He's just, this window is cracked. It's facing this way. This one's this, the color of this. And, and, and the people there are stunned. They're shocked. Okay, But with every description the Prophet was making, he has this moment of, people jeering at him and laughing at him. And this is something that we as Muslims, we have to understand will always be there. If, if you are looking as a believing person to be welcomed and coddled by everybody around you when you state the things that you believe in and your convictions, then you're, you're, you're a little bit mistaken. There will always be people that challenge the notion of your beliefs, the very core of them, the essence of them. They will challenge those things. They may not laugh in your face. They may not make you feel, you know, little in that moment. But there will be always people that will disagree with you. If, if the standard for what is true is people agreeing, then we're lost. Right? The standard for what is true in our hearts is it came from Allah through his messenger to us. So I'm not trying to win a popularity contest as a Muslim. I'm not trying to get everyone to agree with me and to manipulate what I can from the text to make sure that it sounds nice. I'll do my job, and it already, I know it sounds nice. It's Kalam Allah, it's the beautiful speech of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. it's the example of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If I have to explain it in a way that is presentable and easy for them, that's different, but I'm not gonna leave things out and change things. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being honest, he's being true to himself. And every step along the way, there's laughter and there's mockery. But there's one person that in the midst of all that mockery, you hear a voice that is escalating above the mockery and saying, Sadaqti Ya Rasulullah. You're hearing one person whose voice is elevating and is saying, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you're being truthful. Because everyone else's laughter is saying what? You're a joke. But one person is saying you're being truthful. And this person is the same person that when the Prophet wasallam, when he described him, he said that everybody, everybody, this is later in Medina, he said everybody that I told about Islam, they hesitated even for half a second. Like when I came to them and I told them, not about, they didn't disbelieve, they didn't challenge, but they just kind of were like, what? Like, hmm, you know? Interesting. He said the only person that didn't hesitate when I told them that I am a messenger of Allah was this person, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Everyone else kind of gave like a little stutter step, like, huh? Abu Bakr was the only one that said, you're the messenger of God. What well, the Prophet Saul said him one time in a gathering was praising Abu Bakr. And he said that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu an, he said that if I were to give Abu Bakr all of my money and everything that I have, my property, everything that belongs to me in my name, if I could give it to him, it would still not repay him for the loyalty and dedication he had for me my entire life. And he's sitting in a gathering and he looks at Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr's crying. You know what he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Everyone's looking at Abu Bakr. It's a powerful moment. He looks at the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, what is money without you? What's the purpose of this dunya without you? You could give me everything. And everyone thinks that I'm the wealthiest now, but if I don't have you, I'm the poorest. So in reality, you think that you're rewarding me by paying me back, Ya Rasulullah. Being your companion was the most valuable thing. It was the thing that made me rich. This is what Abu Bakr, some of us wonder like, how did he have, how did Abu Bakr always have the courage and the strength and the fortitude to always do the right thing? 
and to always make the right decision. You look at so many companions. You know, we have great stories of companions who they might have faltered or stumbled. They were human. Abu Bakr was one of those guys that just always got it right. And you find that the reason why this is amongst many was because Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was somebody that understood the value of the Prophet in his life. It was non-negotiable. It wasn't something he could, you know, you could never convince the, that Abu Bakr that the Prophet wasn't the most important person in his life. You could never convince him that his religion was something that was up for, gra- up for sale. It wasn't like that for him. So in that moment, when he's being surrounded by mockery, when the Prophet ﷺ is literally at the, 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 the pressure, right, in a pressure cooker of people that are challenging him, of incredulousness, you have one voice that escalates and says multiple times, Sadaqti Ya Rasulullah, Sadaqti Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ finally, after the last time, he looks at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and he says, Enta Siddiq. He says, you keep saying that I'm truthful. No, you are the truthful one, Ya Abu Bakr. Ya Abu Bakr, you are the one who's being truthful. Being truthful for what? Being truthful because every single one of us, every day, when we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulullah, when we are saying that, that claim, we are not stating a fact, we are stating a hope. We're stating a hope that we believe. Ya Allah, we hope that we can live a life that is congruent with this statement, that we believe that you are the only thing worthy of worship and that your messenger is Muhammad sallallahu It's not a fact yet. We don't know if it's a fact until we die. Right? That's why when Allah Ta'ala calls out, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, all you who claim to believe, there's always a little bit of a challenge that's put in those verses. Right? Why? Because we need to know that we're following the right path. Everyone needs a checkup. So when he tells Abu Bakr, Enta Siddiq, what he's telling him is Abu Bakr, in the claim that you are a believer of God and that you believe that I am the messenger of God, you are the most truthful one out there. There is no one that comes close. And this is the one voice that stood amongst many that supported the Prophet ﷺ. This shows us something really valuable. Islam, and by virtue of Islam, Muslims, have never been obsessed with numbers. We don't really care about numbers. We care about the right people, not the amount of people. We care about being surrounded by, even if it's only one, we care about the quality of the company that we keep. Many people in the era of followers, in the era of you know people likes and engagement, many people take a lot of pride in how many people know them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we learn from some of the scholars that there are many people that are famous in the dunya, but they're completely anonymous in the akhirah. No one will know their name. They'll just be another inhabitant of the hellfire. May Allah protect us. And there are people that are walking on the dun- in the dunya, on the same earth that you are walking on, and you're walking next to them. Imagine New York City, right? Smells like a bathroom. Anyways, right? Imagine... These, <laughs> I had to, I'm from Chicago. There's always got to be uh, a you know, beef there. Zabiha beef. Uh, so <laughs> imagine you're walking past somebody, and this is how the great awliya of Allah, the, 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 you know, people who are close to Allah, they never want to offend anybody because they don't know, like, maybe this person could be close to Allah. Even though they are unknown to me, they could be famous in the heavens. Maybe the angels are, 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 maybe the angels are following after this person. How we say fangirling, right? Maybe they're like fan-angeling after this person, just trailing them. Why? Because when everyone else is asleep in the middle of the night, this person stands before Allah or sits before Allah when it's dark outside. Do you guys ever think about how amazing that is, by the way? The most sincere moment that you can have with Allah is in darkness. Like there's no sun out. You're sitting there before the sun has even risen and you have your hands cupped quietly to Allah. If you've never done this before, you have to do it. If you wake up early, right, when you get to my age a little bit, it's not because you're energetic, it's because you have to go to the bathroom. So when you, if you wake up early before Fajr and you sit there and you have your hands cut before Allah and you are pouring your heart out to Allah, you know, if you, if you think that you're going through something, if you need Allah and you haven't woken up for tahajjud yet, you, you're not really going through it yet. You got to sit there before Allah and open your hands and pour to Allah and realize that not a soul is awake, is aware is listening, if you refresh your feed on Instagram, nothing's happening. You're going to get all that ad for like AG Greens and like all these random like pre-workouts and whatever it is you follow, okay? 
and furniture that's too expensive for you? No, no one's posting at that time. It's time for you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I thought it's always, I always thought metaphorically it's so powerful that the time when you are closest to Allah is when everyone else is asleep. <laughs> no distractions. Just me and the one that I need. Because when everyone wakes up, I get busy with distractions. But when they go to sleep, I'm with Allah. So the believer is more concerned about those, the quality of the people, the quality of the moments. Not, they don't care about who's around them. They don't care about the amount of people that are looking at them, that know them, that remember them, that this and this and this. And that was the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Bakr. In the middle of Mecca, with people shouting at him, laughing at him, calling him liar, this and this, crazy, this and this. And these words hurt him. Allah Ta'ala said that these words hurt him. مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ He had to actually like console him. You're not crazy. You're not what they're calling you. So words hurt. But amongst the cons consolation that Allah gave the Prophet Sallallahu was a good friend. Right? And this is when he needed him most. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq always proved to be that good friend. So when the Prophet Sallallahu returned, we learned some valuable points here. Number one, he didn't let his principle waver. He went from the lowest moment of his life, Am al huzn the year of sadness. He went from the lowest moment of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah elevated him to the highest point of his existence. To a place that no human has ever visited before, has ever gone to. Had a conversation in a way that is befitting to Allah, in a way that no one else knows about. And then when the Prophet ﷺ came back, when he received the salah, when he received the prayer, when he had that moment, after going through the toughest time of his life, he displayed and showed strength and conviction and trust in Allah that was admirable. And amongst him, his companion, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us this conviction. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us this strength. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us good friends. We ask Allah Ta'ala to surround us with people that reinforce us in truth and that remind us to be truthful. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to surround us with people that soften our hearts and that we are around, when we are around them, our hearts are softened. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. We'll let inshaAllah Mufti Kamani come now and share uh, you know, some of his reflections before the Isha prayer. I encourage you all to stay here. I'll tell you one thing. The Isha prayer, inshallah, is going to be the most valuable thing that you did tonight. Beyond all the lectures and everything, if you can pray your Isha and Jama'ah here, inshallah, it will be the most valuable thing that you did tonight, inshallah. So even if you need to get a break, go out and get some water, you should definitely listen to Mufti Kamani's lecture. But if you have to go use the bathroom, that's fine. Try, inshallah, to, to make the Jama'ah for Isha if you can, inshallah. Uh, no one here has work tomorrow, I think, right? Some kind of weird fake holiday, right? What is it tomorrow? Something. Yeah, President's Day. There we go. We don't believe in presidents in Islam. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my kids are out of school, so it sucks for me. But yeah, so come inshallah and join us. Uh, Jazakallah khairah. And many people are asking about heart work tomorrow night. We are having heart work tomorrow night. Many people are asking what's the topic. You will find out inshallah. Um, I tried, Mufti Sab, I tried. I'm so sorry, I tried. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salam ala ibadihi al-ladhin astafa. Khususan ala Sayyidi Rasuli wa Khatim al-Anbiya. وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد It's fascinating because every year when we're in Rajab we have this gathering about Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj There are those people who get caught with celebrations and choose to do things that are actually not from the deen of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In Islam, we have a very clear set of rules when it comes to engagement with the deen. 
anything we ascribe to the deen, anything we add to the deen, anything we do in the name of the deen, must properly be represented by the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This idea of just adding things as you go along and making something out of nothing is frowned upon and we refer to it as an innovation, as a bid'ah in certain parts of the world when it comes to certain days of Rajab there are foods that are made and people say that this is the sunnah food to have in Rajab there are gatherings that occur, these are sunnah gatherings to have in Rajab someone asked one of the mashayikh once, one of our teachers, teachers what's the sunnah meal to have in Rajab and he said, other than at one or two occasions in the Prophet's life, there was never a prescribed meal for any time or day. The greatest you'll find is that Rasulullah would have dates at certain times and on certain dates. Certain days. Dates. It was known that Nabi would have dates at iftar. Similarly, he would have dates at suhoor. We also know that days would go on and end while Rasulullah would suffice on dates. Other than a few things here and there, there is no, oh, on this day, there is going to be this thing. This is inherited from other uh, faiths and religions where per holiday, they have a special meal attached to it, like kind of like Thanksgiving. And we've turned Rajab and Al-Isra wal miraj into that. What we are doing here today is very different. As an educational institution, we like to use every opportunity that we can to educate people about our deen. So this gathering has much more to do with education, connecting with the Prophet ﷺ, connecting with the teachings of Nabi ﷺ. People ask this question that is there any particular act that needs to be done on the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. First and foremost, no. And secondly, it is almost impossible with any level of certainty or even um, conviction to claim any one date to Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. The debate among Muslim scholars on the, on the date uh, for the occurrence of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj is highly debated, let alone the date, even the year. Some historians have gone as far as saying that the incident occurred somewhere in a four to five year window. They're not even able to point it down to a year because there's so much debate on this. And this leads to another point, which is that incidents that occurred prior to migration, the scholars tend to differ a lot when it comes to opinions on when they occurred. Because documentation wasn't as prominent. People were still private, practicing Islam privately. People were figuring out things on their own. Not everything was public in the sense that people were writing down things or keeping track of dates that this happened here, this happened there. Once migration occurs, now things become very clear. Battle of Badr, 17th of Ramadan, second year after migration. We can give you an exact date. It was the 17th of Ramadan, second year after Hijrah. Battle of Uhud, we can give you the exact date, and so on. The incidents after migration are very different from pre-migration, and this, is may, this may be one of the reasons why Umar an chose migration as the point for the beginning of the Islamic calendar because after that things were recorded. So much more was recorded post-migration as opposed to pre-migration. So people ask that is there anything specific to eat on the day? No. We don't have anything from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is there anything specific to do on that day? No, because there isn't even a way for us to determine the exact date. If we have a difference of opinion regarding the year, then everything else after that. And as for the month of Rajab, a good number of scholars have actually leaned in this direction. I'm talking about historians. So therefore the scholars have held that possibly towards the end of Rajab is when this incident occurred. As for the occurrence of the incident itself, it is undeniable, unquestionable. Because the reference of that is found directly where? In the Quran. There is an entire surah named what? Surah Al-Isra. Al -Isra. The Mi'raj is not referenced by name in the Quran, the Isra is mentioned by name. Clearly. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram. And then when we turn to the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ahadith, there is abundance of reference there. 
um, Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, Imam Muslim rahmatullah alayhi, Imam Nasahi, all of them, they have narrated the narrations regarding Al Isra wal Mi'raj. When we were studying hadith, I recall, we were studying Sunan Nasa'i with our Shaykh, Shaykh Bilal. And the first, we started with Kitab al-Salah. He said, I'm going to start the book with Kitab al-Salah. So we went to Kitab al-Salah, which is not the first chapter, but he wanted to start there. So we started from Kitab al-Salah. And the first hadith in the chapter is the one about Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And I kid you not, we probably spent two, three months just on one narration. Two or three months on one narration. Every day he came in and talked about it further and further and went into more detail and went into more detail. And I share that because there is so much to discuss when it comes to the narration of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. But there is one narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I wanted to share with you that's narrated by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih and with that we'll conclude the night as well. Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it's a longer narration of the al-Isra wal Mi'raj and he says fu'utit fu'utit so then I was given three things I was given three gifts on the night of al-Isra wal Mi'raj the first of those gifts the prophet of Allah said what was it salat Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned back with salah. And it's not that salah wasn't being prayed before. We already know that salah was being prayed even prior to al-Isra wal Mi'raj. The second and third revelation of the Quran referenced prayer. قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ تَقُومُ أَدْنَا مِنْ ثُلُثَيِ اللَّيْلِ وَنِسْفَهُ وَثُلُثَهُ وَطَائِفَةٌ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَعَكَ The ayat of the Quran had already referenced salah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was already praying. Bear in mind that Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj, according to the most common position of the historians, occurred um, in the 10th slash 11th year of prophethood. So, Salah was already obligated for 10 years. The riwayat tell us that after the first revelation, Jibreel alayhi salam then came again and told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught, taught him how to pray. The early companions were seen praying Salah in the mountains of Mecca and the Quraysh would come and throw stones at them. This is also known. And Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, the Salah was completed in the five in total. First Salah was obligated as one prayer, and then from there it became three prayers of obligation, and then at the night of Isra wal Mi'raj, it became a total of five prayers in obligation, completing off the fard, that this will be the obligation. Muslims were commanded to pray five times a day. And when we use the word command, it seems to be very daunting and overwhelming. But the truth is that the prayer that we do five times a day, if you do it with the right perspective, it's you hitting time out on life five times a day. It's taking a break from the world. You can choose to pray it as an obligation and be burdened by it, or you can view it as a gift. It's a matter of perspective. How do you view it? I can look at a laptop that my father brought from me when he went on a trip somewhere as a big clunky, you know, metal object that I have to lug around everywhere. Or I can look at it as his kindness, that he remembered me. When he was there, he didn't have to think of me, but he did. So when we think of, when we think of salah in reality, it's a gift from Rasulullah. That's how you need to view your salah, that I'm about to, every time you say Allahu Akbar, I'm about to engage with that gift the Prophet brought back from his Lord when he went on that beautiful, honorable night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had his intimate moments of whispering, we have that opportunity as well. The second thing that he said, Khawatimu Surat Al-Baqarah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he also came as a gift, he brought the gift back of the closing verses of Surat Al-Baqarah, which are so profound and beautiful. The closing verses of Surat Al-Baqarah the translation of them, Ya Allah, we are broken human beings. We're trying our best. Don't hold us accountable to perfection because we're not perfect. Right there. Ya Allah, I'm not perfect. I'm a mess. Ya Allah, don't hold us accountable if we mess up and we, when we make mistakes. Rabbana la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala ladhina min qablina. Don't give us a burden that the people before had to carry. Don't give us a weight 
to carry that we don't have the power to carry. Rasulullah felt like he was carrying a lot in his life. So he came back with this gift, these verses, just making dua to Allah and connecting back, Ya Allah, allow me to carry my weight. Give me strength to carry the weight that you have determined for me to carry. Allow me to reach my potential. Don't cut my road short. Fa'afu'anna, pardon us for our shortcomings. Wa'afu'anna, forgive us for the wrong that we do along this path. Wa'arhamna, and have mercy upon us to give us strength to keep going forward. Fa'ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin, because shaitan and the disbelievers aren't making this any easier. So be with me by my side. And the third, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah promises he will pardon the sins of every person that comes to him on the Day of Judgment who did not commit shirk. And in one riwayat, al-muqhimat, those sins that destroy a person, Allah will, fall, Allah will forgive them. And that's optimism for us there. That no matter how hard it gets, you keep doing tawbah, you keep turning to Allah again and again, but you don't give up. You can't give up. There's no choice here to give up. Giving up on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving up on your akhirah. It's basically lighting your, jan- your jannah and turning it into jahannam. I was talking about this with the students at the seminary earlier. You know, a rock climber who's climbing without a harness is holding on to a chunk of rock. And the thought crosses his mind that, buddy, just stop. You're in a tough place. He can't give up. There's too much on the line here. If he loosens that grip, he's going to die. So every time you're struggling and shaitan says, let go of Allah, it's useless. He's never helped you. Just let go. Just let go. It's not an option. And don't be fooled by shaitan. He is, you know, the devil. <laughs> I was going to use an adjective, but I was like, why not? Why? Just use a proper noun. He is the devil. So he comes to you when you are most vulnerable, not when you're straight and strong. He comes to you when you're sick. He comes to you when you're sad. Who goes to someone to convince them of something when they're sad? A predator does. Someone who's unethical does that. Imagine I tried to sell something to you and try to make profit off you when you were emotionally down. Would you accept that? Yes or no, folks? So shaitan comes to convince you of the most important thing in your existence, the absence of God, when you are sad. How treacherous is that? And here we are, when we're at the lowest point, we probably wouldn't even decide at that moment to purchase a pair of shoes because we know we're emotionally not sound, we're making decisions about our relationship with Allah. Whoever dies from this world without making partners with Allah, Allah says, I'll take care of you. Just stay loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep your salah going, and keep those verses of Surah Baqarah part of your life. They create the human within you. It's accepting your human side. It's pleading to Allah while invoking your humanity. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخْذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَا وَخْطَانَا May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept and grant barakah in this night. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons our shortcomings and allow us, allows us to live by the teachings of Rasul alayhi salatu salam and allows us to take inspiration from his beautiful life. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَلَى سَيْدَ مُحَمَّدْ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Assalamu alaikum, inshallah. We're going to be ending the night, inshallah, with salah, with Isha salah. And conveniently, actually,